Ee, kıymetli katılımcılar, e, bu uzun günün e, son oturumu online e, bir oturum olarak devam edecek. Ama oldukça ünlü, konusunda da oldukça deneyimli e, meslektaşlarımız bizlere e, kendi konularındaki deneyimlerini aktaracaklar. E, şimdi hattımızda doktor, hepimizin de yakından tanıdığı e, Sayın Profesör Doktor Roberto Bergamaschi var. Kendisi dünyaca tanınmış bir kolorektal cerrah ve kolorektal hastalıkların laparoskopik cerrahisinde uluslararası alanda tanınmış bir uzmandır. Amerika Birleşik Devletleri'nde laparoskopik ve minimal invaziv kolorektal cerrahide eksper bir kolorektal cerrah olarak tanınmaktadır. Halen New York Üniversitesi'nde New York Tıp Medical College'da profesör ve şef yardımcısı Westchester Hastanesi ve Mid Hudson Hastanelerinde kolorektal cerrahi bölüm başkanı olarak çalışmaktadır. Çalıştığı klinikte eğitim programı ve bağlı bulunduğu derneklerin programlarıyla her yıl kolorektal fellowlar kabul etmekte ve eğitim vermektedir. New York Kolorektal, e, Kolon ve Rektal Cerrahlar Derneği Eski Başkanı Büyük Britanya ve İrlanda Koloproyektoloji Derneği Birliği Dergisi Kolorektal Hastalıklar Editörüdür. Kolorektal cerrahi ve minimal invaziv cerrahi alanında çok sayıda makale, kitap bölümü ve atıf sahibidir. Amerikan Kolorektal Cerrahi Derneği başka, başta olmak üzere birçok e, derneğinde kıdemli üyesi ve yöneticiliğini yapmıştır. E, Sayın Bergamaski, e, buyurun. Sizi dinliyoruz. Mant Vagons sunumunuz için. Uh, Professor Bergamaski, I uh, shortly introduced you uh, to the salon. So we are ready for your presentation. Uh, if you are able to, uh, we will be happy to hear you. Okay, thank you very much. So let me start saying thank you to my old friends, you know, in this uh, very nice society. Uh, thank you for, uh, you know, keeping me in mind and involving me. Uh, um, uh, I, I chose this topic, which has kind of an unusual title, as you, you know, as you may have noticed, it's called Van Valens. The reason why I'm choosing this is because I want to make sure that particularly the, the youngest people, uh, the youngest surgeon, uh, understands the implication of what of, of this of this phenomenon. I don't have any disclosures. And uh, the first thing I want to say is that we all should not be against innovation. Without innovation, we're not going anywhere. However, we need to understand that innovation is not an enemy of safety, and safety is a very important uh, aspect of, of innovation. This is the Belmont report that you know dates back to 1979, probably the only uh, United States government st uh, statement, you know, document that is protecting uh, uh, patients for, from research. And I think, you know, it's, it's worth, you know, being aware of this document. So innovation and safety are not antagonists. Okay, let me start talking about bandwagon. So what is a bandwagon? A bandwagon is, as you can see in this picture, something that, you know, is quite common in some countries, you know, that are um, uh, celebrating carnival, for example, like Brazil, like Italy, you know, but also in the 1800s, they didn't know how to support a, a United States candidate for, for the United States presidency at the White House. So this clown uh, called Dan Rice, he thought that he would make a bandwagon, as you can see with the horses, and he was starting to uh, basically do a campaign to support a candidate. And he was saying, jump on the bandwagon, meaning he was telling people, be with us, support this candidate, but he will not explain why. So that's the point of the bandwagon. So the bandwagon effect is essentially when you have, when you're accepting a popular idea just because it's popular, but it's not proven. Why? Because maybe you desire to conform with others, you like to be fashionable or uh, 
you think that other people's judgment is you can trust, or you are a conformist, you want to conform with the majority. Or maybe you want to rally, as they say in English, you know, dancing or be with, with the winner. So the objective of this talk are to speak about bandwagons in surgery, explain how you can identify them, and what does the bandwagon mean in methodology, in scientific methodology, and then I'm going to speak particularly of the colorectal bandwagons and what you can do. The famous bandwagon in surgery are certainly phlebotomy, frontal lobotomy, tonsillectomy, and, and, and mastectomy. Um, one way to identify bandwagon is that it, it gives, it offers a very easy solution, one size fits all, as they say in English, to a very complicated clinical problem. But most important is number two, in my opinion. Number two, it means that nobody else can reproduce the same results. So a surgeon claims that he gets those results and then another number of surgeons are unable to reproduce the results. That's the difference between art and science. So a bandwagon in, uh, in methodology is basically, you're familiar with type one, type two errors. So type two errors is the one where you don't have enough sample size, but the type one error and false positivity is the typical equivalence of a bandwagon. Now, this said, you need to understand that there are problems that are not resolved in colorectal surgery. So these problems may have led to a bandwagon solution. One problem is that when you do a Hartmann's in an emergency for a perforated diverticular peritonitis, you know, many of these colostomy will not get reversed. It is true that after uh, rectopexy, you can have an issue with obstructed de defecation. Also, uh, remember hemorrhoidectomy? There is a lot of pain after hemorrhoidectomy. That's, that's a, still a, a, a persisting problem. And then remember, um, there is something called the low anterior resection syndrome, like, you know, impotence, you know, um, retrograde ejaculation and all that comes with in uh, rectal cancer surgery. And the last problem is the, an obese male, a very obese male, you know, very strongly built with a very narrow so-called android pelvis and a very bulky mesorectum, that can be difficult for uh, a rectal cancer surgery. So let's go through the bandwagons. Perforate the colon with peritonitis. So it goes way back to Dr. Mayo, uh, founder of the Mayo Clinic, to do an operation where he would do a laparotomy and he would do lavage. Uh, then went on for some reasons, you know, even before World War II and during World War II. And then suddenly in 1996, we have this uh, Irish group that claims that you don't have to do anything but just throw, throw some water, you know, some saline rather, into the abdomen, wash it out, you know, with a laparoscope, and the patient will be just fine. So, the first thing I am upset about is that they don't do justice to the literature. So these guys are claiming that they invented lavage, when in fact lavage existed already in 1907. Second, when you go to these uh, Dutch studies, you know, randomizing, you can see that 20% of the patients were reoperated for uh, abscess, or reoperated for, for recurrent you know, post-operative peritonitis. Basically, uh, the IRB means Institutional Review Board, means Ethical Committee. The Ethical Committee had to terminate this study before it got too ugly. The second study...
Dr. Bergamasi, your uh, microphone is off now. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, go on. Okay, sorry. I don't know what happened. So let me so let me go back. I don't know where I stopped, but basically this is another Scandinavian study trying to randomize patients to lavage versus uh, something else. And it basically another another study that su a lot of suffering for the patients, you know, nothing, nothing came out of it. I just want to say something about ethics. When the disease of the colorectum asked me to write a, a simple criticism, that's what I wrote. I wrote that consenting a patient in distress, a patient in the emergency room who is in peritonitis, and you want to tell him that he has, a, he has an option to have a colostomy or a not a colostomy, what do you think the patient is going to do? Of course, he's going to go for no colostomy, although he doesn't understand the implications of, of, of the lavage. So it's too easy to consent a patient who is in distress, you know, maybe in, in sepsis in, in the emergency room. But this is the worst coming, and I haven't even published this. I reviewed thousands of patients, and I found out that 11% of these patients that undergo lavage, I'm talking about randomized control trials only. There is 11% of these patients that actually have a perforated sigmoid cancer. And it takes approximately five months to, to figure out that they actually have a cancer and not a particular, five months. Let's go to the next. I put ventral in quote unquote uh, because it's not ventral rectal vaccine at all, and I'll tell you why. First of all, we always spoke about posterior or, or ventral, depending on where we fix the stitch. Where do we pax the, the rectum? We pax it to the, to the psoas, uh, this was 100 years ago. We pax it to the sacral promontory, so that's where we call the, the paxi about posterior because we are fixing it posteriorly. Now, in the 1949, there is, a, there is this study that was paxing to the vagina. In, uh, in, uh, in uh, Switzerland, Deutscher presented this study where they would fix paxing, if you prefer, the, the rectum to the pubis. So this is a ventral. But none of this is known to the, to the junior people because, of course, uh, you know, the surgeons today, they're trying to fabricate that they are inventing something new, which is not new at all. And that this is the list of the low recurrence rates, safe in octogenarians, no resulting constipation, excellent quality of life. This is a bandwagon. Look at this. If you go back to the old books, you will learn that the sympathetic nerves that are running behind the rectum, they are actually inhibitory to the rectal wall. So even if you injure this, uh, this nerve by a posterior dissection, you're not gonna do any harm to the, to the, to, uh, the, the patient is not gonna have a constipation because you, you're doing an injury. On the contrary, because you're injuring a nerve that is inhibitory. Now, it had to come so ugly with this ventral rectopexy with the mesh that the Scottish government has prohibited this operation because the uh, mesh is eroding into the vagina. And you can imagine, I'm going to stop right there, the consequences of a mesh coming out of the vagina. Now, this is the only study that I, I recommend you to read is from Denmark and it's a great study because they are finally randomizing and you know patients to the classical suture rectal vaccine which I do uh, you know I used to do it open when I because I'm old then I did laparoscopically when I was younger and now I do it robotically it doesn't matter but it's a suture rectal vaccine there is no mesh it's very simple in works versus the so-called ventral, which is not ventral. And they showed in this single center trial that there is no difference. There is absolutely not true that the ventral is su superior. 
So let me go to the next. The next is the PPH is an acronym for something that is called hemorrhoidopexy. Uh, you remember um, this was uh, run by a friend of ours, uh, Antonio Longo, a great surgeon that definitely can do this operation well. However, when this operation is not done well, that's what you get. So you get a staple line that is way too low uh, to the dentate line, and that has created in the United States a lot of lawsuits. As you know, some states, particularly New York, is very litigious, and the lawyers are onto it. So it never really took off in, in this country. But there is another issue that you gotta pay for for the for the cost of the staper, and that, that can be a difficult uh, problem, you know, for the. CEO of the hospital because the reimbursement from the insurance company is very low because the cost of the hemorrhoidectomy is considered very low. So there are issues specific to the United States. Nonetheless, uh, a very respected surgeon called Neil Mortensen, who used to work in Oxford, he tried to do a randomized study and he has to suspend it because of a lot of pain in these patients, you, we, we will never know if they were placing the staple line too low, uh, as I just said in that showed in that in that picture. But there is another thing that he found out that I find interesting, is that the mechanism is not clear, but the there were muscles of the internal anal sphincter, not of the rectal wall, but of the internal anal sphincter into the into the stapler about this operation is that you need, really need to know how to do it well because you can do a lot of damage with the perforating particularly anteriorly in men you can catch the the urethra and create a urethra right of fistula and you know and go on and on now we're going to something a lot more serious than hemorrhoids that's rectal cancer you familiar with this acronym? It means watch and wait. Basically, 10 years ago, one of the most uh, uh, respected surgeons in colorectal surgery that changed the way we operate rectal cancer, Bill Hill, as we call him, made a, a, a huge meeting in Portugal where he sort of blessed this watch and wait uh, hypothesis that was originated from Brazil. Uh, last year, last year, the Norwegian government, I'm sorry, this is in Norwegian, but basically the Norwegian government, and the reason why I speak about Norwegian is because as, as some of my Turkish friends remember, I was in Norway for 10 years before I moved to America you know, 20 years ago. So I do have contact with them and I understand their language. And basically the Norwegian government put a moratorium, basically prohibited watch and wait in Norway because of the disasters that they had. Now, let me go back to something. So already way back 20 years ago, when this idea came from Brazil, a, a surgeon who was the chief in uh, uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering in Manhattan, uh, who is now uh, unfortunately passed away, the chief of Coretta, he did this great study. He did neoadjuvant on, on, on all cases, T3 and T4, of course, and, or node positive. And he then look at the, look at the, uh, at the, and operate on everybody, and then look at the pathology report and realize that he had a 19% of clinical. Uh, complete response, you know, on endoscopy, which he then verified by operating everybody and realizes that of the 19% of clinical, so-called clinical, if you prefer mucosa rather than clinical response, 75% of this 19% still had rectal cancer foci, meaning, you know, pieces of, of tumor in the rectal wall. So actually, there is a huge discrepancy between the complete response clinically and the pathological response. 
The second point to remember of the bandwagon is reproducibility is impossible. So these British guys, they showed, I don't know if I can, you can see my, my uh, pointer, they're showing here that of 30 publications, 18 were from the same Brazilian surgeon and 12 from others. And this article in British Surgeon Surgery basically say that these studies, the, the Brazilian results are not reproducible by others. And perhaps the, the Brazilian patient had a very early erectile cancer that responded to radiation, but that is not the same as applying this treatment to T, T3 and T4. So making it more uh, um, ridiculous is there are 70 different combinations of the definitions of clinical complete, or if you prefer, the French uh, Saint Antoine in Paris did a great study where they show that even if you have pathological response in the rectal wall, when you operate, of course, you still find 46% of metastatic lymph nodes in the mesorectum, if the cancer is T3, it goes down to 7%, still 7% in T1 and T2 tumor. So this means that the problem is not just the rectal wall, it's also the, the lymph nodes in, in the mesorectum. Now, one good slide, positively rather than negatively, is that the future, or if there is any future from the, for this, um, clinical complete response is this type of MRI, diffusion weight imaging, which is not very common still. Uh, a game changer is this uh, study that shows that radiation may not be necessary. So uh, basically is, remember, number three, is less appealing to patients to have an operation than to opt for watching weight, no surgery. They like it. Transcendental TME, let me run fast. Norwegian government, again, this was two years ago, uh, prohibited transcendental TME. Transcendental TME was uh, brought up as a solution for obese patients. I, I studied the, the, the, the, the three studies that were supposed to support this, and I can tell you that the annals of surgery study was saying that you need to reduce the distal margin. You can get a very small distal margin. We don't need a distal margin more than, than one centimeter. So basically, to make it a long story short, transcendental TME is making a coloanal anastomosis on people that don't need a coloanal anastomosis, people that can have a, a colorectal anastomosis. You know, this is the registry from uh, Paris Tech's voluntary registry. They recruited female patients they don't need transcendental TME, and they were operating on patients with cancer. They were 13 centimeters up from the anal verge. I'm going to cut short on this because, you know, I'm, I'm over time and I don't like to be over time. But look at this study. This study, to achieve the result that they like to publish, they included 40% of the patients that were dead. The dead were still in the study, counted as recurrence free. So you need to learn statistics and really read through the methodology to understand who is cheating. Non-probability sampling, this is a great example. So you are inviting your friends to do a study with you because your friends have the same idea that you, but you're not inviting somebody else that doesn't agree with your idea. So you are biasing your, your, your results. Anyway, I'm concluding. Be very careful with bandwagons. You need to critically evaluate the evidence. You need to encourage critical thinking. Don't think necessarily like the others. You need to think with your own head. And if you suspect a bandwagon, you have to call it out. Thank you.
Dear Dr. Bergamaski, I would like to thank you for this inspiring and valuable presentation and sharing your knowledge. Uh, it is really a difficult setting uh, to implement new methods without estimating all consequences due to this bandwagon effect. Yes, uh, all, always uh, we need to be careful and proceed evidence-based. Thank you very much for your, for your presentation. So I will now ask uh, for any questions to, to the salon and let you know. Yes, thank you. Evet, uh, Doktor Bergamaski'nin sunumuyla ilgili olarak salondan soru, katkı e, varsa kendisine iletmek istediğiniz. Uh, Dr. Bagamaski, thank you very much for your presentation. Now uh, we don't have any questions. Uh, again, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.